Deborah Driggs has a fascinating, inspirational story. She uh, exemplifies discipline. Uh, started uh, very young in California as a figure skater, uh, went on to do commercials, was the cover of Playboy, uh, Playmate of the Year, uh, 1990. She's had up and down since then. Uh, she went to, she did great commercials. She went to acting school. She ended up getting married, got a divorce and went to real estate and the market crashed and uh, some other things happened there. But we talk about the highs and lows in her life. And now uh, she's created a publishing company. Her memoir will be released uh, in 2022. But just fascinating inspiration. I ask uh, how she got there. What was it like? Uh, she worked with Paula Abdul, for example, at the cheerleading squad in Los Angeles and what Hugh Hefner was like at Playboy. But it's a fascinating conversation with Deborah Driggs. Uh, we find out a lot about her and, and how we can learn uh, from the mistakes that she made and uh, how we can turn it around and turn a failure into positivity. You're going to like this conversation. Thanks so much for listening. Hi, I'm Joey Pins. People ask me, how did I lose 130 pounds? The quick answer is always discipline. I started my business, wasn't paying attention to my health, was eating too much, you know, drinking too much sweets. My daughter was born. Next thing I know, I'm pre-diabetic, I have hypertension. I knew something had to change. Discipline. I, like many of you, have faced many challenges in your career, in your family, in your life, in your faith. How did you attack them? How did you approach them? How did you solve them, hopefully? It all had to have some degree of discipline. I'm also asked, how did you found and start a tech business that lasted over 25 years? Discipline. I was committed to it, enjoyed technology, didn't enjoy some aspects of it, but knew it was necessary. Discipline. Our podcast mission, how do we use discipline to better ourselves and society? Join me, please, as I talk to interesting people and discuss how they use discipline in their family, in their passion, in their careers, and how it helped them. Our podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. It will be light and serious. Join us, please. Thank you for consideration. So how did the discipline of figure skating save your childhood? Well, you know, I think growing up kind of in a, in a chaotic environment, you know, where I had two parents that didn't really get along well, and they were very young. You know, they had me when they were eight, 19 and 22. Mm. Um, I think that with everything going on internally in my life, in my environment, that ice skating actually really saved me because it provided structure it provided mentors, it provided coaches, it provided life lessons with guidance at a young age. It provided, you know, learning how to lose and learning that failure was okay and you get back up. And so all of those things really came from the ice. And then, you know, I'd go home and it was just a completely different environment. There wasn't a lot of mentorship or parenting or, you know, I had two parents that were working really hard just to get by monthly. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of money and my mom worked two jobs to pay for my ice skating and provide that for me. So going home to that environment from the ice skating environment, you can kind of see that really as a kid, I understood that that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to be on the ice because that's where I felt the growth and the learning. And I think as human beings, we crave that. We crave growth. We crave learning. We crave expansion. And and so my life was very simple and quiet. And then I'd get to the ice and it'd be all these lessons and, and, and people that were really influential in my life at that time. That's fascinating. You, you talk about one time you lost and your coach was, you know, what are you doing crying? Oh, what yeah. She yanked me by the hair. Okay. So, so for all our little snowflakes out there. Um, yeah. So back in the day, you know, coaches were allowed to yell at you and kind of right. grab you. And 
And that's how it was, you know, not everybody got a trophy. Okay. So yeah, no, my co I came off the ice and I was hysterical. I fell on every jump. It was my first competition. I was no so nervous that I couldn't even see straight. I it felt like a dream. And I came off the ice and I, I, I completely was mortified and embarrassed. And she grabbed me and took me in the bathroom and literally was in my face telling me, you know, we don't have time for this. Pull it together. We're going to go out there and you just rise above and you, you are going to be professional. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, think about it. I think I was 10 or 11 for, this was a big competition act professional. I mean, for a 10 year old, that's a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but that was exactly what she said. You know, you need to act as if you're going to go and kick ass the next time and we'll just have to work harder and you're going to need to learn how to perform. And so those were the, those were the really amazing lessons that took place, you know? So I'm really thankful for that. It was funny because you know, every once in a while, I'll get on the ice now, and I skate with this woman, Katie, Katie, and she and I will skate around. She's younger than me by about 15, 16 years, and so I said, you know, when I was skating, I don't know how it was for you, but not everybody got a trophy, and there was a lot of yelling and a lot of, like, it was a very disciplined sport, and she goes, yeah, it was the same for me, too, and she said, you know what's funny, Deb, is recently I was judging a competition and this dad came up to me and he said, Hey, you know, my daughter was in the competition, but she didn't get a medal. And she said, Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. What, what, what did she place? And he said, well, she didn't place. She was in the competition. And she said, well, this is ice skating and in ice skating, unless you're first, second or third, you get zip. <laughs> it's like, and I said, that just it's like crazy to me because what lesson are you teaching? These are valuable lessons to lose. You know, some of the best growth I've had was in losing because I just told you about an experience where I completely lost and fell apart. And from that, I had so much growth and, and really, really quick growth because I never wanted to be that embarrassed again, ever. And so I just think we're robbing kids of these growth experiences, emotionally, spiritually, competitively. It's like, wow, let them fall down. There was a great book that was written in the 90s. And this is when my kids were born. And, and so I read this book because it was right along, you know, the way I thought and my, what my views were. But it was called, I don't know who the author is, I can't think of it. But the name of the book is called The Blessing of a Skin Knee. And mm. the book was literally about, you know, let your kids fall down and bleed. You know, we're so quick to want to fix everything and they never really experience. And she actually, because in the 90s, it was very apparent that kids were getting to college and the colleges could tell which kids were coming really prepared and which kids were coming and just completely falling apart because they didn't have mommy or daddy faxing their homework, showing up with a lunch that they forgot. You know, my kids knew that if they forgot their lunch or they forgot their homework, that was on them. Don't call me. I have to work, you know? And so, you know, I just think we're so afraid to let kids fail. And by the way, let them fail big. Let them mm -hmm. get these lessons as kids, that's what growing up is about. And I, you know, I think we're really robbing that experience. Okay. I agree. <laughs> well, I, I think Tom Hanks put it best when he said, there's no crying in uh, baseball uh, and bring it over to figure exactly. skating. Exactly. Sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, I coached my daughters in soccer and, um, you know, when they were very young, they're, they're often in college now. And uh, I, I can remember, you know, some of the girls, this is six or seven years old, they'd fall down and they'd kind of look up at you, you know, as it, you know, and I say, Hey, this is just like life girls. You fall, you get back up, keep going. Come on. You know, you could tell if they're really hurt, but yeah. you could, you know, they're kind of looking for your reaction. And, uh, you know, when it was time to give the, 
you know, the participant awards, I'd have a talk with the parents and I said, you know, are you sure, you know, you want it, you want this, this is a participant, you know, I, I we didn't win, we didn't win, you know, we were, we were 500 right by them in between. And, uh, some of them were like, no. And some were like, absolutely. And, you know, what do you, you know, what are you going to do? This is a league thing. And, you know, you try to do your best, yes. you try to do your best. Yeah. And then, so then, uh, move forward and, uh, so the LA Express, you got the big cheerleading job. Yeah. So when my ice skating stopped, I was, uh, you know, 14 going on 15 and going into my freshman year of high school. And, you know, I, I, I was really lost. I think my freshman year of high school was a really tough year for me because I was lost. My identity was completely smashed. Um, I wasn't skating, you know, eight hours, six to eight hours a day anymore. Mm. And, so I saw, I was in high school and I saw the drill team perform and I was like, oh my God, that looks so fun. And so I tried out to be a song leader for my junior and senior year. And that was so much fun. And then I was a cheerleader in college. And in college, my mom, I think my mom told me about the LA Express having tryouts at the Hollywood Palladium. And she's like, you should try out. And I was like, no, because, you know, it, professional cheerleaders were these voluptuous, long hair, sexy dancers. And I was short hair braces and I looked 10 years old and I'm like, there's no way they're going to pick me. And so I said to my girlfriend who was on my squad, I said, do you want to go with me? And let's just do it for shits and giggles. So we went and there were over a thousand girls lined up at the Hollywood Palladium. And we thought, you know what? We, we were so naive that we weren't even scared because we thought we're not going to make it anyway. So we might as well just have the most fun, whatever happens, happens. And so literally the Hollywood Palladium is pretty big. And so they had all the judges and then they had us run out and we had a two minute time frame to run out in front of the judges this was the first audition and just do something and then run off and from that they narrowed it down to 100 maybe 50 girls 75 hmm. maybe 50 to 75 girls they narrowed it down and then there was a second audition well my two minute routine was the highlight on the news <laughs> and so everybody was calling my house, you know, obviously this is before the internet and before, you know, it was a dial phone. So everybody was calling my house. Oh my God, we just saw Debbie on the news. Cause it was every news station was picking this up. And so I got called for the second audition and that audition, Paula Abdul came in and taught us a routine cause she was a famous cheerleader on the lakes of uh, Lakers. The Lakers, yeah. And so she came in. I actually have photos. She came in and taught um, for the second routine. We had to learn a routine and then perform it. And then I made that cut. Next thing I know, that the next one is at the Red Onion in Marina Del Rey. And Lee Majors, who was part owner of the team, was the big judge at this uh, audition. Him and a few other people. And we had to make up a routine and perform it live at the Red Onion. And so they narrowed it from that down to the squad, which I think ended up being 26 girls. And both my girlfriend and I made it. We were the two youngest on the squad. Hmm. We both had braces and we both looked 10 years old, you know? So it was just, it was crazy that we, that we even made it. And she went on to cheer two years for the LA Express. And then she became a Rams cheerleader. Huh. So she had a big cheerleading career. I ended up going to Japan from that gig and dancing in Japan. And while I was in Japan, I started modeling. And that just kind of started the whole path of I'm going to be an actress. I'm going to be a model. And I just kind of intuitively knew that that was the road I was going to go down. So in 1984, I came back and started that career. Yeah, you have a great story about your first commercial with Mickey Rourke. Yeah, yeah, that is crazy. So this is what happened. So I was actually brought in because the girl that starred in the commercial, it was for a, a Japanese whiskey called Suntory Whiskey. 
And the girl that starred in the commercial, I can't think of her name, but she was a, an actress back then. And she did a famous movie called Breathless with Richard Gere. Yes. And so she's a beautiful French actress. And I, I have a similar look to her. And so she couldn't finish the commercial. So they brought me in. So they brought me in on the audition. I got hired on the spot because I really do look pretty similar to her, back, especially back then. And so the shoot was that next day, really. It was They, they were in a f frenzy trying to get somebody because she had already gone back to France. And so I show up at the set the next day. It was on the uh, Universal lot. And it was really funny. I had the, the, the PA came up to me and he's like, okay, I'm going to take you to your trailer and then I'll take you to introduce you to Mr. Rourke. And I went, what? <laughs> and he goes, Mr. Rourke. I'm going to you can meet Mr. Rourke and the director. Blah, blah. I go, well, who's Mr. Rourke? And they go, Mickey Rourke. And I go, he's here? And he's like, he's the star of the commercial. I literally ran back to my, I had a Chevy Blazer at the time. And I had two roommates, all of us aspiring actresses. And back then I had a car phone. I don't know if anybody would remember what that was. I remember. But I had a car phone. Yeah. So I called turned on the car and called them. And I'm like, you are not going to believe this. Guess who I'm doing this commercial with? And they were like, what? Ah! And we're all freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, I'm dying. What am I going to say? You know? And I'm like a kid. I'm like, oh my God. I think I was 24. I, I was a baby. He was married at the time to an actress called, uh, her name was Deborah Fury. And so anyway, they took me out to the set and I'm sitting next to him and I can't even look at him, you know, because this is when he was really big, you know, it was yeah. in the eighties. He was huge. And so anyway, that was quite the experience. But anyway, in the commercial, I'm holding an umbrella. You can't see my face because I'm this, I'm standing in for this other actress who had left and they had to reshoot, reshoot the scene. Anyway, that's how I think the story is. You know, I didn't really know all the details. I just knew I had to be on the set. And I knew I was going to be standing in the rain. That's all they told me. So, yeah, that was interesting. But Great my very story. first commercial, um, when I got an agent, the very first commercial that I was sent on, I booked. And it was for a non-dairy creamer for Japan. And it was called Creep Christy. And it paid like 600 a day. And I just wow. remember my agent called me and said, you booked it. And, you know, I be, I literally became quickly, you know, my agents were taking notice because nobody booked their first audition ever. Mm. You know, I mean, mm. that was pretty, that's like one in a hundred, you know, people go on their first audition and book it. And so they took big notice at that. And so, yeah, so I ended up booking a lot of commercials and that really made me look at, you know, how I, the bigger picture, I wasn't just going to do commercials and print ads. I was going to, I was going to act. And so I had to start really taking that seriously and taking classes and all of that. So right before you started the school, which I'll get into a moment, you really had perhaps the lowest point in your life to that point. Uh, the drinking. Uh, when I started high school? No, the, the around 18, I thought it was where you had your DUI. No, actually, so you know, I, I think that 18 was a tough year for many reasons. But really, you know, I, I was one of those people that for some reason was able to pick myself up and keep going. You know, high mm. school years were definitely party years for me. I barely graduated high school. I kind of. You know, with no supervision in my life, it just, it was, it was no, it was no surprise that I wasn't graduating, you know, with really good grade point average. And I remember when I made the squad in college, the, I made the squad and then Betty Shear called me into her office. She was the head of the squad at the college I went to. She called me in her office and she's like, I just got your grades from high school and you can't be on the squad. And I was like, what? And she, and cause this was like all I wanted to do. And she's like, yeah, you can't 
be on the squad, your grade point average is really bad. Like it was like a D average. And I said, yeah, but that was because I had a really hard time in high school, but I'm going to do really well here and I'm going to focus and really apply myself. And she's like, okay, well, you're going to be on probation. And I was like, okay, great. Put me on probation. And you know, that was good for me because finally I had an adult in my life that was holding Mm. me accountable. And what happened because of that was I ended up on the Dean's list my first semester at Saddleback. And You know, it's just all about, you know, if you have somebody that believes in you, you have your mentors, your coaches, and I really believe in that so much. Even today at my age today, I have mentors and coaches and things that uh, seminars, whatever it is you want, you want to call it, but I have those teams in place, systems in place because I need to grow and learn even at my age today. And if you don't have that in your life, you'll just, you know, it'll just kind of stay like this. And really that's not what life's about. It's about all the, the waves Hmm. that you have to ride and the growths. But with all this positivity happening, you know, and getting on the squad, you're getting these great commercials, you're uh, a cheerleader there. I, 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 I think of the analogy of the duck. We see the duck kind of moving along in the water, but underneath the feet are just paddling crazy and there's kind of chaos under there. You were having a little bit of that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, everything always, people would say, oh, well, it comes easy for you. You know, I'd get, Mm. people would say that throughout my life. Well, as if it was just handed to me and I'm like, first of all, I don't, nobody I know was in the entertainment business. So there wasn't anybody guiding me. All the mistakes and the things that I did, I had to learn either from doing it well or doing it really bad. And I didn't have, and it wasn't until I really put myself in an acting class, I did a two year Hmm. Meisner program. And that's when I really learned the structure of the business and not just acting, but just the whole, you know, show business perspective. And, And it wasn't really until then, you know, I was a really, I was a kid, I was naive. I was running around Hollywood, you know, I was a hustler. You know, and nothing wrong with that. You know, I was hustling and, you know, I would, I would literally, I would, I remember when I first started, uh, get, I would do extra work on films. And the big thing in the eighties was, you you know, everybody was trying to get their SAG and after card. And so I would, I would go up to directors. I would go right up to them. I had no reluctance. Like there was nothing holding me back. And I would just say, Hey, just give me a line just give me a line and let me get my SAG card, you know? And I mean, I, that's how I was. I was relentless, you know? And the more I was on sets and the more I was doing stuff like that, the more I was learning and, you know, and then at some point I finally, I finally found a back door in on how to get my SAG and after card it, you know, and it, everybody knows it, it was a grind to get that and you can't work unless you have it. So mm. <laughs> it's kind of a catch 22 chicken and the egg. Yeah. You talked about being a hustler. You, I remember one story you told about when you were young, the neighbors uh, were, I think they were Japanese and they needed a tutor for their kids. Yeah. Oh, that was my first like entrepreneurial business. Really. I had a really rocking business in uh, seventh grade. You know, I was ice skating. I was going to a private Catholic school and I was also, uh, you know, I was really socially awkward. So on my free time, I was tutoring. I lived in Torrance and in the 70s, it was really a lot of Asian kids in my neighborhood and and the parents didn't speak English and they wanted their kids to speak English. And so I remember my neighbor asked me because she saw me in my uniform if I would teach her kids to speak English. And I was doing well in school at that time. and, And so I went to the first grade class at my school. It was a small school. And I knew that teacher and I said, could I borrow some workbooks and, and, um, cause I'm going to do some tutoring on my free time. And she's like, absolutely. And so she helped me put a program together. And then once I started helping that child and that child started getting really, you know, showing progress, they started referring me. I was all over the neighborhood, tutoring kids and making cash, you know, and at that age, that was a lot of money. 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You don't see that much even these days at that, at, at that young. I don't think there's an appreciation. When I was that age, I was helping my father and I was paper roots and these kinds of things. Yeah, you did everything, uh, you know, it's like you did $20 yeah. here, $10 here. That's and right. it was like, that was a lot of money yeah. back then. And you weren't, I was never given money. So if I wanted to oh. spend any, I had to earn it. <laughs> yeah. Guess what? Yeah, just like yourself. I remember my dad, this is a you know, I was so resentful when this happened, but now looking back, it's probably one of the best things that happened to me. But my dad was just, he never gave me a dime mm. ever. Like I started working at 14 because he did not buy me school clothes. He didn't give me anything. And my senior year in high school, I turned 18. I turned 18 in December. So I'm an adult now in my senior year of high school. And once I turned 18, he came came into my room with a cigarette, you know, and he was like, okay, you're 18, you're an adult, you can start paying rent. Wow. And you know, that really just hurt my feelings so bad because I thought, my God, you ass, I've been working my ass off for four years in high school, working full-time jobs, paying for all my school stuff, paying for, if I wanted to be a cheerleader, I had to pay for it. And he had the nerve to like, in the middle of my senior year, asked me to pay for rent. And I remember I called my mom and I was crying. She had remarried and she was now living in Dana Point with her husband in this beautiful home. And I was crying. She said, come live with us. So hmm. they lived in Dana Point, but her and her husband worked in Gardena. And so that's what I did. I left halfway through my senior year. I moved to Dana Point. I commuted in with them to Gardena, left my car there, and then I would drive to school every day. So I was wow. getting up every day at the end of my senior year at five in the morning, commuting from Dana Point to finish high school. Crazy shit like that. Very disciplined you are. Very yeah. disciplined. And you're very kind of, other than your coaches, it would seem to me, in ice skating, your first mentor really came when you took the acting school for two years. You talk about a mentor there that you were scared of and... Uh, a big impact in your life. Yeah, she, uh, Joanne, I studied with Joanne Barron and D.W. Brown, and they were not, this was serious, you know, and when I took the class, when I was, you know, it was 1989, 90, you know, right, 88, 89, 90, somewhere in there, and I remember how strict it was the first day, like, you can't go on auditions, you can't do this, so, you know, they really, and if you miss hmm. a class, if you miss more than two classes, you're out and you have really had to work with your scene partners. And, and so I was thinking, oh my God, what did I sign up for? And so, yeah, but she was the first person that kind of saw through me because, you know, when you're acting, you're reading behavior. And it was the first time that somebody was calling me out on my bullshit. Hmm. And hmm. she just kind of pulled me aside. I was a kid, you know, and she was just like, there's something going on with you. And, you know, she'd like analyze me, but the things that she would say were so spot on. And I was like, whoa, nobody's ever talked to me that way, you know? And how do you know that about me? And, you know, cause I would thought I was so good at hiding who I really was. And, you know, deep down, I was really in a lot of fear. And, and I, th I, I, I had the talent, but I was very fearful. Very interesting place to be. Yeah. And then um, shortly after that, Playboy? Yeah. So uh, 1989, I got a call from my agent that Playboy was coming out with a book called The Lingerie Book. And they saw my photo and they wanted to see me about shooting a cover. And so I went to the famous building on Sunset. I, you know, I drove by right. it a thousand times and never occurred to me that I'd ever walk in that building. And so I walked in and they handed me a robe and asked me to go take off my clothes and they were going to do a Polaroid. And I said, Oh, I'm not here for that. I'm, you know, I'm here for the cover audition. And she said, well, everything we do involves nudity. We need to see your body. Now back then, you know, they're looking for tattoos and piercings and scars and all of that because that was a big deal. It's not a big deal today, but it was a big right. deal back then. And I said, okay, well I left my undergarments on and went out and did the Polaroid and the photographer's like, well, we need to see your body. I'm like, ah, ah. So I laughed and kind of poo-pooed it and thought, that's not for me. And that afternoon I got a call 
that they wanted to shoot me to be a centerfold. And I thought, I, I think you have the wrong girl, you know, because it was just not, I didn't see myself that way. And I really did. I really thought they confused me with somebody else who was auditioning. And, and so next thing I know, I'm in, I'm on a eight week photo shoot, shooting to be a centerfold for the magazine. And that just became a whirlwind that changed everything really. Yeah, it certainly did. And what was Mr. Hefner like? Ah, amazing. Just amazing. Wickedly, wickedly smart, you know, Mm. and I like to be around really smart people, you know, that when I leave, I'm just like, whoa, you know, and he was just that way. You know, he's quietly funny. He was very observant and he was very consistent. You know, he had Mm. a routine and it never changed in all the years that I knew him or spent time at the mansion. He had a very consistent routine in how he did things and how he lived his life. It's fat is a fascinating individual. Oh yeah. And, uh, very fascinating. And that, now that changed everything for you, but then we kind of have, a, a another kind of big down, excuse me, downfall because you got a, a role and then you missed the read. Yeah. Wow. You really did your homework. Yeah, I did. I, I, I booked, I, Deborah Aquila is one of the biggest casting directors in Hollywood and she took a liking to me and I went in to read for a movie with Mimi Rogers. Gosh, I'm not going to remember the name of it now. Sacred something, or I don't know. It was kind of a religious movie, a take on religion, I think. And I booked the movie and it had a kind of sexual threesome scene in it. Hmm. And I got really nervous about it and I didn't show up to the read through. And I think that was probably the first big regret that I had in that industry. That was the first time that I thought, oh shit, I really fucked up. I really fucked this up. Like Hmm. she's big. She's huge. And I had to apologize to her. And, you know, she, because I remember when I auditioned for her, she, she said, you know, you really remind you, I think you're going to have a career like Laura Sanjimako, who had just done Sex, Lies and Videotape. And and she said, there's something about you. And, and she was giving me a shot Hmm. and I really fucked it up. Like it was so my, I remember my manager yelling at me. How could you not show up? Like I just literally shut down. I didn't call anybody. I didn't tell anybody I wasn't going to go. I mean, I just shut down and sabotaged the whole thing. And it was the first time that I saw something in myself that I was like, holy shit. Like, who do I think I am? Like I completely just sabotaged this whole thing. And people are at the read through and they're like, where is this girl? You know, (laughs) it was bad. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, hard lesson, but you know, I will tell you, I did apologize and she actually did bring me in for another, another project, but you know, those things are hard to repair once you fuck up like that, fuck up royally, you know, never did that again. I can tell you that if I booked something, I showed up. Absolutely. So then, uh, I think I had the chronology, chronological, uh, chronology, right. I'm not sure if I said that correctly. Chronological. And so you're in park, yeah, chronological, <laughs> yeah. Uh, around 97, you're married, you have three children, and you're facing a divorce, and you were, uh, how should I put this? You were very unkind to yourself, the way you were there, the way you... Yeah, I got um, divorced at the age of 40. So mm-hmm. at 40 years old, I got divorced, and, you know, I I found myself divorced three young kids. Uh, I raised them in Park City, Utah. We didn't have a lot of money. And so I found myself like, it was kind of a double whammy. And I think this was the second time in my life besides age 14, when I lost my skating career and my parents went through a divorce. It was those similar feelings that came up of now, who am I? What's my identity? It's like another identity crisis. If I'm not Mrs. Gaylord, who am I? And if I'm not the wife of Mitch Gaylord, if I'm not, you know, I it just was really 
and it was very on my part it was very immature immaturely handled and i just didn't have the 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 toolbox at that time in my life and so i had to really go and reinvent i went into a real funk after my divorce you know i just thought you know i i kept i i was talking to myself in a way that you would never talk to another human being <laughs> let's mm. just put it that way you know and i think mm. that's really important to hear is how we talk to ourselves is 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 our body hears it and i was not being kind to myself at all yeah i i saw what you you talked about that by the way just as a side note when my girlfriend uh, found out you were married at one point to Mitch Gaylord, this scream of happiness that I mean, she, she forgot about, she remembers him and just, uh, only had great things to say. So then you kind of had a real estate career there in park city that went very high. And then of course the crash brought it down. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and that was, that was a great time in my life because I, I was working with a great team. I felt really just on purpose. And I, I felt smart, you know, I had never used that part of myself, you know, where I had, was doing business and I, it felt really good and started getting on a roll. And then 2008 hit and I'm in a small market, second home, luxury ski resort, multi-million boom, gone. You know, it was the first thing to go. <laughs> Who's going to buy a second home in a 2008 market. And so Things just really shut down again, and that really sent me into a, a tailspin because I really had no money. I can remember the temple that we belonged to, like offering to bring groceries to my house. Right. It was like mortifying to me that I was like, oh, God, I'm back in this spot, you know. So I, the kids went to live with their dad for a bit, and I went and lived with my mom in Ocala, Florida. And it was an interesting time because I was online trying to apply for work, trying to apply for jobs. And I was applying for work and jobs, not trying, but, you know, I just didn't feel good about myself. And I started my, you know, I was like, I couldn't, you know, when you just like, I can't get out of bed. I had no, mm. my self-esteem was just mm. in the dumps. And my mom was like, can you just walk the dog for me? I'm not feeling well. And just that was like, it pulled me out of myself, this ridiculous self-pity that I had. And so I started walking the dog and started meeting the neighbors in the neighborhood and getting to know people. And, you know, I mean, it sounds really corny, but those people really saved my life because I had a purpose. As small as it was, I was walking the dog and I was interacting with people that really had big problems, bigger than mine. And it really taught me a big lesson about life, you know, that it's not all about me. And that other people are suffering also. And the sooner I started really taking interest in that, you know, about other people and what they were going through, the less I cared about what I was going through. Mm. And that's a good thing. Really good thing. Yeah. Your quote was that dog saved your life. It really did. That dog saved my life. To this day, I call my mom and I'm like, where's my girl? Heidi, she saved my life. I remember that the first couple of days that I got to my mom's and I was just, I couldn't stop crying and I'm sitting in the mm. chair or whatever. And the dog would literally come over and put her face in my face and she just would stay there. And she'd just be like moving her head like so that her, her dust mop would be rubbing up against me. And I'm like, she knows, she knows that I'm so sad. It was so incredible, you know, and she just was like there for me and just a little lover, you know, dogs are incredible. Yeah. They, there's unconditional love with dogs. Beautiful. It's uh, so it is beautiful. beautiful. So now your memoir, let's talk about that. When's it coming out? So I have a few books that I'm working on um, oh. and that it, it's all 2022. Um, yep. I'm, the memoir is written and, but what I've decided is I put holding on that one because I'm publishing a book that my grandfather wrote, my oh, mother's wow. father. And we are at the point now where it's being published and I'm self-publishing it. And so I should have that book in my hand 
probably in three to four months. You know, it's a hmm. real. I, I, I'm I'm learning all about self publishing, and I formed my own publishing company. Because at the end of the day, I thought, you know what? If I'm going to do all the work to promote it and sell it and put it out there, then I might as well just self publish it and own all the rights. I also feel that um, his book, after I read it a few times, could possibly be a screenplay. And Hmm. it's a really well-written book. And the few people that have read it, you know, the editors, the copy editors, and, you know, because there was a long, laborious process of really making sure that it had a flow and everything matched and all of that, all that editing. Um, After doing that, you know, those people called me and said, you know, that was a really interesting book to read. And I thought, okay, cool. They like, you know, they're getting paid, so they don't have to like it, (laughs) you know. You know what I mean? Like they're getting paid to edit. They're not getting paid to like your book. And so they don't get paid extra for like, they're not, they don't have to say anything really is what my point is. And so the fact that they called me and said, that was a really cool book to read. And there's a lot of interesting facts and what's cool. So what made me slow down on mine is that I think it's going to be really fun to publish that book. And then I took, I'm having my mom work on her memoir and then Hmm. mine. So there'll be like a series that'll lead up to mine. And it's really has a lot of, you know, reading my grandfather's book and it's a historical fiction. So it's based on his life. He didn't want it to be a nonfiction, but reading it, it was really interesting because I thought, wow, there's, I can see where I get a lot of my tenacity and perseverance and all of that. Wow. So you're entering the publishing business. I yes. mean, that is a tough business, yeah. isn't it? I talked to a lot of I started authors. that process in almost a year ago. Wow. And I've learned so much. And what I had to do was kind of pull it back and slow it down because I was like, I'm just going to write a book. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And you know, it's like, that's, mm. that's great. I love that kind of motivation. But <laughs> then I really was like, okay, now I'm going to learn about the process, you know, and, and see how I'm really going to do this and, and kind of come up with a plan you know, if I put my book out first, it, it, I think it's better to put his out first. And so, you know, it's hmm. like you start structuring a, a, a plan around how you're going to do things, but yeah. So it's been really interesting. I started writing a weekly blog. So I have a website now and every Monday I post a new blog. It's called Deb's Den and it's an inside look at things I've gone through in my life. And I write about them now. And I, I'm, pretty, you know, vulnerable and open and I'm an open book, you know, it's like, you know, I've had a lot of struggles and I've had a lot of ups and downs and I've had a lot of great accolades and, but you know, when you're down and you're on your knees and it's dark, nobody's coming, you know, and, Mm. and that was kind of the big lesson for me. It's like, I've got to learn how to save myself. And I think I walked around for too long thinking that something magical was going to save me outside of myself. And today I keep it very simple, you know, and I save myself on a daily basis. It's all about loving this first, loving what I'm doing, staying on purpose, going to bed at the end of the day with no regrets, no resentments, Mm. like, and if there is anything that happens, you know, I try to fix it pretty quickly now. I don't let it sit for too long because those things will eat you up inside. Yeah, they certainly will. And life is short, Deb. You never know if... Oh, trust me. It's been a really odd year, you know. Well, obviously in the world, it's been very odd. But in Mm. my world, I I have uh, at least four or five people that have passed away this last year. And not just Mm. COVID. I've had, you know, a few overdose and... And my daughter just lost a very dear friend to an overdose. And, you know, it's, it's hard out there, you know, so it's good to have a good support. It's good to have people that care and people that you can go to, you know, when I was going through a lot of my tough times in my life, you didn't have you, I didn't have YouTube. I didn't have Google. I didn't have things where I could go and listen to somebody who had been through, you know, for a long time, I thought I was alone. I really thought I was in this mad world all by myself. And it's not the case. You know, we're all Hmm. suffering. We've all suffered. We've all had difficult times. And there's so many great, beautiful resources out there. And that's kind of, 
what I thought to myself is I thought, wow, you know, my website should be a resource for somebody. If they're, if they want to know what it's like to surrender, they can Google surrender and hopefully my blog will pop up, you know, and that was kind of the purpose of it was just to be able to write from my heart about really tough experiences and, and not just tough experiences, but, uh, you know, just things that are good and bad, you know, not everything is good and not everything is bad. Not everything is hard. Not everything is easy. You know, it's like an ebb and flow of a bunch of stuff. And, but some things are going to be unbearable and you're going to think, Oh my God, it's the end, but it's not. I've had many times in my life when I, when ice skating stopped for me, I can just tell you, I didn't think life was worth living because my whole identity was in my skating and I missed it so much that I didn't think worth was uh, life was worth living. I would have missed out on so much, you know, but that's how I felt at the time. I was in a major identity crisis and, and, and didn't have tools and didn't have support. You know, nobody in my life was going, it must be really hard what you're going through. People were just like, suck it up, move on. You know, that's how the mentality was around me. You know, stiff upper lip. My grandmother was British. My mother's British. So I have, you know, very tough women in my life, Hmm. but it doesn't, it's, it's not nurturing. And so that's, that was missing. And it took me a long time to realize that that was the missing ingredient in my life was that there was no nurturing going on. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, The British are, uh, very strong and, uh, Sarcastic occasionally. Yeah, um, I grew up with a lot of sarcasm. <laughs> yeah, a lot of sarcasm. You know, sarcasm. and as a child, sarcasm can be very scary because yes. you never, you don't know what's real. What, what, what are you ta- What are you saying? You know, and then I became right. sarcastic. You know, not yes, everything yes. is funny. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my uh, girlfriend's uh, son has autism, and uh, sarcasm completely evades him. He doesn't quite grasp that. And sometimes I occasionally live there and, uh, it's his reactions can be quite funny. I love, um, so one of your the favorite quotes that I have, uh, that I've written down here is that, uh, every w- the worst thing that has happened ended up being a blessing to you. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that has happened has ended up being a blessing for me. You know, I, I, I get to choose the story I'm the director of my life. I get to change the narrative anytime, any place, anywhere. I get to choose how something affects me. And that's really important to know and understand. And so, yeah, I look back on my life and that there's nothing I could change, really. You know, there's nothing I could change. Because hopefully my story and my memoir and my blogs or whatever is helping somebody else that maybe he's going through something that's even worse, you know? That's very enlightening to, uh, yeah, there's a whole goal of, I think, of sharing these kinds of things is to help others. So, Deborah Driggs, thank you so much. What an absolute pleasure. So how can people get in touch with you? You mentioned your website. Let's talk about, again, other ways to get in touch with you. Yep, it's www.deborahdriggs.com. You can sign up for my weekly newsletter, and I literally will send some inspiration every week. I am on Instagram. So I, I post a lot on Instagram and, and I'm on all the social media, but mainly my, my website. And what's great about, you know, following me on my website is I will be posting, you know, magazine article. I just was featured in two magazines and, and I just did a film. I worked on a film, uh, which was really cool because I hadn't worked in 10 years. So Mm. it was uh, maybe even longer, actually. And so, you know, all that gets posted on my on my website. And then when the book when the books are getting released and and if I'm traveling, if I'm going to be in a city or whatever, that'll all be on my website. Excellent. I can't wait. I hope we get to travel soon. Um, yeah. We're not quite sure what's happening right now, but uh, I look forward to that. And again, Driggs has two G's in case anybody is wondering. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Deborah, Driggs-y. thanks so much for your time. That's what my, oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, yes. 
I yes. co-host every Sunday night a really fun podcast. It's called Roger the Wild Child. And we interview rock legends, actors, uh, entrepreneurs, authors, uh, music moguls. I mean, we've had some really fun, interesting, inspiring guests on our show um, from Steve Weber from the show Wings to Ron Moss yes. from Bold and the Beautiful to Kenny Arnoff, famous drummer, Jason Sheff, who used to sing with Chicago. I mean, we have like really <laughs> fun guests and it's a fun show, really light. And we were just named on the 75 best podcasts list. So we're number 59. Wow. Yeah. And Very we've cool. only, I've only been doing the show since April. So that's a pretty cool accolade. And so if you're, if you want to check it out, then you should follow me on Facebook because every Sunday it's live five Pacific standard time and we post it and just come join the fun. Excellent, excellent, Deborah Driggs. Thank you so much for your time. You're an absolute delight and inspiration and Thank very well disciplined. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for allowing me this time. Thank you. You be well. Bye right. now. Thank you.